ಹಾಗು ಜೀ ಹಾವು ಜೀ ಹಾವು ಜೀಯ good afternoon to all of you i thank you priti for your words of introduction and for inviting me here today together with mandira to celebrate or to celebrate the lives of second gentleman dessas gill and sri kuldeep nayar who i did not know personally but i met on a number of occasions and always admired I think it is apt to speak on the theme of borderlands here in Hamburgsa today. You belong to a city where history is constantly being made in chrysalis as it were waiting to happen. On your story is etched the experience of great religious and spiritual awakening, entrepreneurship and enterprise fearlessness the tragedy of partition which we be alluded to war and peace you are situated in a geographical borderland you speak to us in many voices that resonate you are in what in borderland terminology is the quintessential contact zone by contact zones i mean the space of encounter where ideas cultures language and lifestyles trade and commerce ethnicities poetry and prose create a confluence where the courage to speak out and the quest for freedom from fear to debate and accommodate difference and to celebrate diversity is or at least it should be an enduring constant my focus over of black stones and of course as i said the himalaya the abode of eternal snows from where we draw our strength and inspiration that all lie to the north of us and the shadow falls on us in fact this is where borderlands and contact zones begin contact zones which are now no longer what they were because politics intervenes and the concept of sovereignty speaks the final word as one of my senior diplomat colleagues famously said when the chinese entered tibet in 1950 the himalayas no longer exist that may be an exaggerated depiction of circumstance but the contact zones the borderlands in the karakoram and the himalayas today are fractured and fissured by circles of containment and conflict and the destinies of their inhabitants are determined in new delhi islamabad or beijing these capitals have turned ventriloquist speaking for the cosmos that was the borderland but borderlands are not limited to mountain frontiers alone or areas nearly contiguous to international borders between sovereign nations countries in themselves can also fit the definition of borderlands consider india for instance 19th century european travelers called india the celebrated region because on examining its position in the map and here i quote one cannot help perceiving that in regard to communication and consequently commercial intercourse its situation is most advantageous the whole of southern europe is open to india through the persian gulf while the passage around the malay peninsula helps communication with the oriental islands with the whole of east asia including the important countries of china and japan with the scattered islands in the pacific 
and with the whole western coast of the American continent. Looking thus at the situation of India, this traveler notes that we find that it is central among nations. So even as India's geographical position is on the margins of these two regions, Europe through the Gulf and Southeast Asia through Myanmar and the Malay Peninsula besides the Andaman Sea, it is a central nation, a connector, a contact zone. It is this centrality that must return to borderlands wherever they exist so that they regain their voice and renew their vitality because they connect and integrate and are the place of every arrival. Today they are fenced in, populated by the ghosts of travelers past, militarized, their mountain passes and valleys, scenes of contest and combat, the, so the south-north axis of trade and pilgrimage and fraternal exchange severed, all doors shut. Kalimpong, a little Himalayan town in West Bengal, not far from the border of Sikkim with Tibet, is a classic example of a borderland that has changed unalterably. An article in the now defunct Himalayan Times of January 1951 commenced its lofty description of the town with the title, Kalimpong, Border Cosmopolis. That term, Cosmopolis, should aptly describe all borderlands. The article makes for delightful reading that induces in the reader a yearning for those bygone days. Kalimpong is termed as that jumping off place, the spot where east meets west, north meets south, between plains and the towering Himalayas, all backed up by colorful personalities. Hollywood, the article says, had missed a bet in overlooking Kalimpong. The town clung to the crest of a flower-splashed ridge, delightfully suspended between the purgatory of the Indian plains and the cool heaven of the Himalaya mountains. It was a place where you could drop your calling card on a Tibetan sorcerer, a yogi, a self-styled reincarnation of Joan of Arc, or a pretender to the long vacated throne of Burma. Populated by various races and ethnicities, the town was where, out of the northern passes, come Tibetan caravans burdened with wool, skins, and musk. Devout Tibetan pilgrims shuffled through, headed for Bodh Gaya, the hub of the Buddhist universe. On the main street, with a bust of Queen Victoria, was displayed the sign, galloping strictly prohibited. But underneath this exterior, there was also political intrigue and concern about the developing situation across the border in Tibet with the entry of communist China and what impact this would have on India's border regions. Kalambong, in the words of one scholar, was a cultural juncture. It was also a frontier, a borderland, and a political edge. Tibetan, Marwari, Nevari, and Kashmiri traders, as well as Chinese merchants, came together for trade and commerce, as well as pilgrims and adventurers, and a good dose of spies to make for a problematic mix. From being an idyllic mountain township, by 1959, both Prime Minister Nehru and the Chinese Premier Chu Lai separately looked on it as a nest of spies. The Chinese media, rather vividly, termed it as a spy center with a stinking reputation. After the 1962 conflict between India and China, Kalimpong recedes into the shadows of history, its entire story waiting to be written. Kalimpong is just one example of how the Himalayan regions of India have lost linkages with their neighbors to the north 
and how old links have been severed by the swirling currents of geopolitics. Ladakh, the Himachal and Uttarakhand Himalaya, Sikkim and Arunachal Pradesh are all part of a Himalayan fringe or Himalayan borderlands of peoples linked to Central Asia and to Tibet by shared historical experience, climate and geography. Modern day cartography glides over these borderlands and the cosmology of the lives contained therein of trade routes and pilgrimage trails and cross-cultural permeation. Cores, peripheries and bordering cultures were all linked through trade and commerce and a sacred geography defined by Buddhism via these borderlands. In the Himalaya, traditionally, cultural boundaries have transcended political boundaries. There is little doubt that Tibet exerted a huge religious and cultural influence on the Himalayan regions. The Tibetans never regarded mountain ranges, passes, watersheds and river valleys as boundaries and neither did the pilgrims from the Himalayan regions and various parts of India who frequented sacred places of worship on the Tibetan plateau. This was a religious and cultural world that crossed the high Himalaya and descended to lower heights as far as climate and terrain suited. The words of a veteran civil servant and administrator who served long years in these frontier areas sum it up. The cultural boundaries transcend the political boundaries and always overflow linguistically, culturally, no matter how much you divide them by McMahon and Durand lines. On both sides, the people were almost the same and there was free flow of trade and ideas. The centrality of margins, of borderlands and peripheries in our accepted framework of frontiers is scarcely recognized today. Although specific country situations may differ, the borderlands of India and China, be they Kashmir, Northeastern India, Tibet and Xinjiang, are not the primary focus when it comes to understanding frontiers and their fractured geographies. Frustrations among the youth, ethnic nationalisms, issues of identity, self-determination, human rights, geographical isolation, the use of armed force by the state, cross-border terrorism, and questions about governance straddle these borderlands. They have tended to be viewed as targets of central government policy radiating from national capitals rather than as areas that possess their own ecosystems of existence where policy must focus on local issues, water, human security, preservation of cultural heritage, both tangible and intangible societal structures, language, that directly impact the lives of people and concern their special identity. The concept of frontier zones, which historically provided for an intermingling of peoples, allowing the retention of close integration across borders between communities in terms of language, custom and religion, as I just mentioned, has been lost. Geopolitics trumps all. This concept of connector zones or recognition of shared habitat that was once common to the Himalayan borderlands is alien to the diplomatic negotiating agendas of today. It is unrealistic to assume that these ideas will occupy the consideration of governments in the future either. The Himalayan fringe that I speak of and which marks the frontiers between South and Central Asia, including Tibet, holds the key to the future of close to 3 billion people in terms of climate, water sustainability, preservation of heritage, disaster management and prevention, and human security, but contested sovereignties and cartographies have prevented the coordinated, sustainable development of these areas and their opening to the world. The Himalayan consensus 
is as yet a visionary and amusing dream, even as largely Occidental Western notions of center and periphery, mainland and margins, dominate the discourse of sovereignty and dictate the closure of borders and traditional points of interaction and movement of peoples. Today, the map precedes everything. It becomes the anchoring geometry for a nation. Mountain passes become a centerpiece of tussles over territory and border claims. As one scholar notes, borders in the eastern Himalaya indicate demarcation lines at the far edges of a multinational power struggle. Just as in the Himalaya, mountain ranges resulted from the physical collision between two tectonic plates, so too the borderlands have developed fault lines and fissures in the ongoing contest, call it collision, between India and China. 1962, the year of the brief war between India and China, was the true moment of transformation in this region when the doors on Tibet from India closed, after which the loss of access for India's border peoples to trans Himalayan circuits was reoriented from north and south bound connections only southward. I have said before that there are two phases in India-China relations. One involving a historical civilizational dimension that linked our border regions with Tibet and Xinjiang, and the second, a modern dimension, largely devoid of emotional or humanistic context, but tied to present policy imperatives. Once upon a time, Ladakh's contiguity with Central Asia and Tibet made its capital, Leh, the emporium of cross-border trade between India, Tibet, Central Asia, and Afghanistan. Your city, Amritsar, was an intrinsic constituent of this many splendor tapestry. Caravan routes converged on Leh and its connection with the Silk Route and Yarkand, Kashgar, and Khotan through the Karakoram Pass of the Dark made the latter the most important and long established thoroughfare between India and Central Asia. The ecosystem of human level contact between our Himalayan regions and these areas is now lost forever. Borderlands are not just land based, but also straddle the oceanic spaces between us and our neighbors. It is but a narrow stretch of a few nautical miles that separate the southernmost districts of Tamil Nadu and northern Sri Lanka. We have lost connectivity in the direct sense of the word between these two areas. Years ago, I remember buying a train come ferry ticket for Chennai, then called Madras, from Colombo, and traveling on the night train from the Sri Lankan capital to Talai Manar in the northern part of the island, and thereafter boarding the ferry called the SS Ramanujan to Rameshwaram in Tamil Nadu, a journey of about two hours. From Rameshwaram, one hopped aboard a train again for the journey to Chennai. And you were there the next morning. Sri Lanka and India were organically bound together by the ties of their people. Migrant Indian labor in Sri Lanka, Indian teachers and businessmen, Sri Lankan students and businessmen in India, easy comings and goings, between the two countries. The uh, train ferry uh, had a special resonance to it. Of course, you have numerous air links between the two countries. But it's not the same as you know, the ordinary people who travel uh, via the train and the ferry between the two countries. That is not fair today. The years of the civil war in Sri Lanka changed all that irrevocable. The ferry from Kalaimanar to Rameshwaram stopped operating decades ago. Little wonder that South Asia is called the least integrated region in the world. This chasm between border regions of two countries, separated by the Pork Strait, is yet another example of how people-to-people -people connectivity becomes the first casualty of political upheaval 
or estrangement between close neighbors. Perhaps there is a need for those of us who live in the metropolitan centers of this country to explore our borderlands more closely in order to witness and to feel at close hand the pulse of the sentiments of our border peoples, who are the first casualties of tensions on shared borders. It is as if, to use a phrase from Doug Hammarskjöld, who used to be U.S. Secretary General, as you know, his phrase was, we have undermined the bridges and poisoned the springs, and in this case, the springs of the inheritance of these border peoples. These are people struggling to preserve their habitats and their unique identities. They have their own special perspectives on the world beyond their homelands, and often come back to the latter despite exposure to more developed towns and cities. The security and safety of their birthplace is preferred, as also the need to preserve its ecosystem and natural resources. Samant Mahajan's recent film, Borderlands, explores the themes of separation, remembrance, longing, displacement, and hope in these areas. It speaks of how people living there learn to negotiate the realities of conflict and political contention. It speaks of families separated by borderlands and women trafficked about the monotony of life in a border town today, refugee camps, human life as we who live in our comfort zones away from these situations do not know it. The Canadian short story, Borders, by Thomas King, speaks of how the concept of borders as it applies today relates not to issues of customs and revenues, but to identity, belonging, justice, and citizenship of those who cross the line. The mother and son in the story are stuck between Canada and the United States, stranded in what Homi Baba has called the third space, and the setting of the duty-free store located between the two borders acquires a new meaning in this context as a place of refuge, hybridity, the third space beyond borders. I'd just like to read a little from the book, I think illustrates the point very clearly. So we are talking about a mother and a son planning to make the journey. And they approach the Canadian border, and that's from where I'm going to be. The mother is driving, and the son, who's a teenager, is sitting. Actually, this is a book for young children, but I thought it illustrates what I'm trying to say very clearly. The border was actually two towns, though neither one was big enough to amount to anything. Coots was on the Canadian side and consisted of the convenience store and the gas station, the museum that was closed and boarded up, and a motel. Sweet grass was on the American side, but all you could see was an overpass that arched across the highway and disappeared into the prairies. Just hearing the names of these towns, you would expect that sweet grass, which is a nice name, and sounds like it related to other places, such as Medicine Hat and Moose Jaw and Kicking Horse Pass, would be on the Canadian side, and that Coots, which sounds abrupt and rude, would be on the American side. But this was not the case. Between the two borders was a duty-free shop where you could buy cigarettes and liquor and flags, stuff like that. So they get to the border, and the border guard was an old guy. As he walked to the car, he swayed from side to side, his feet set wide apart, the holster on his hip pitching up and down. He leaned into the window, looking into the back seat, and looked at my mother and me. Morning, ma'am. Good morning. Where are you heading? Salt Lake City. Purpose of your visit? Visit my daughter. Citizenship? Blackfoot, my mother told me. Ma'am? Blackfoot, my mother repeated. Canadian? Blackfoot. 
Now, Blackfoot is the, is the name of a Native American tribe, so mm -hmm. she insists on maintaining that identity. It would have been easier if my mother had just said Canadian and had been done with it, and I could see she wasn't going to do that. The guard wasn't angry or anything. He smiled and looked towards the building. Then he turned back and nodded. Morning, ma'am. Good morning. Any firearms or tobacco? No. Citizenship? Blackfoot. He told us to sit in the car and wait, and we did. In about five minutes, another guard came out with the first man. They were talking as they came, both men swaying back and forth like two cowboys headed for a bar or a gunfight. Morning, ma'am. Good morning. Cecil tells me you and the boy are Blackfoot. That's right. Now I know that we got black feet on the American side and the Canadians got black feet on their side. Just so we can keep our records straight, what side do you come from? I knew exactly what my mother was going to say and I could have told them if they had asked me. Canadian side or American side, asked the guard. Blackfoot side. I just wanted to tell you the predicament of all of these. The situation of stateless persons of Indian origin in Sri Lanka in the 60s, 70s, and 80s of the last century also recalls the image of individuals stuck in a third space between nations. Even today in Tamil Nadu, there are close to 25,000 persons who came as refugees from Sri Lanka and are stateless. These are persons in a new borderland, the refugee camp, nameless, stateless, and unable to pass an identity. In our century, countries build walls on their borders to keep out undocumented, unwanted migrants. In the old days, walls were built on frontiers to keep out conquerors and colonials. Borderlands are crisscrossed with barbed wire and searchlights and weaponized. And of course you have the borderland of Wada, which is not very far from here, and you can witness what happens there every evening. I have offered a brief picture of borderlands in these remarks. Let me return to Amritsar, as I conclude, and to war and peace, matters that are much larger than all of us combined, and especially as we celebrate the life of Second Benjamin Gill. To the concept of borderlands, I would like to add that of that of the commons, a space we share with all our neighbors in South Asia, which integrates and joins, not dissimilar to that of the contact zone or borderlands. Again, to quote Dal Hamashod, we have forgotten that the weakness of one is the weakness of all, and the strength of one, not the military strength, but the real strength, economic and social strength, the happiness of people, is the strength of all. Oneness is our inheritance and we hold it in trust for future generations. The virtues of solidarity, integrity, humanism go into this concept and together they make for peace. Not the peace that is submission or like the white flag of surrender, but peace that brings empowerment for equality and a safer world. Most of us know of Tolstoy's masterpiece, War and Peace. Reading it, you begin to understand what a terrible thing war is. War is not a polite recreation, to paraphrase Tolstoy. It is the vilest thing in life, and we ought to realize this and not make a game of it. Wars are imperfect chisels to carve out tomorrows, as Martin Luther King said. A young Sikh soldier on the front during the First World War wrote to his father, saying it was a devil's war. A young soldier from Garhwal in India's Himalayan belt wrote, It is very hard to endure the bombs, father. There is no confidence of survival. The bullets and cannonballs come down like snow. The mud is up to a man's middle. The distance between us and the enemy is 50 paces. The numbers that have fallen cannot be counted. What more graphic descriptions can be provided about war, about the cannonballs, about the enveloping mud, and the overwhelming numbers of fallen? 
most of all are in combat, even if they are separated by 50 paces, the fighter and the fought, the victor and the vanquished, the living and the fallen, are victims of the demeaning of their common humanity. Here, war, the battlefield, becomes the commons where only the dead and wounded are counted. And this is where the commons also becomes a wasteland. To the west of us lies Pakistan, both of us crafted from the same timber of humanity, but like two planets on a foolish force. With Pakistan, we have taught ourselves to prepare for the worst. The legacy of partition seems concentrated in our borderlands. The periphery defines the core of bitterness between us. The problems in our relationship or those relating to the issue of Kashmir cannot be solved easily against the backdrop of a landscape pockmarked by the absence of trust. Perhaps our generation, and at least two or even three more, are condemned to live with this reality in our lifetimes. The problem will outlive us. It is not that these problems are unsolvable in a peaceful manner without mutually assured destruction. Perhaps neither side will achieve what it regards as the best solution. Maybe what is called hesitant Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. It was wonderful, and it's always is. She's a, a wonderful treat to listen to. I would like to invite uh, the Vice Chancellor. Uh, Dr. Sampu, please, to come and make uh, the announcement and talk about the project that we did. Thanks to Mr. Rao for having a great lecture. Just we were saddened that uh, in Amritsar and our university, we have people from all over the world, like we have also Africans here from South Asia also, but we can't have one from Pakistan. That's the unfortunate part of it. Especially with the subjects that we have, they're not very much here because uh, especially the department of genetics and then food medicine, which is street work in the university, but they can't avail of the facilities we have here. Uh, for the information of the audience, uh, the NDU is the State Public University as the like top university of India with the only one in Punjab, the general leader with the category one status, which is uh, which is a very elite status. Uh, the iconic university, the Nile University, unfortunately happens to be category two, but we are category one, so for the last three, four years. Uh, and uh, why we have the case status is primarily because we are very open to the collaborations for mentoring of our students. When in 2018, when we think we started the Mother House, uh, they approached us that they would like to partner with JNTU and it was actually our, we are honored that they partnered with us and the kind of victory uh, inputs they given to our students and to our faculty has uh, actually been tremendous and we actually owe to them. Uh, yesterday, Ms. Neger was with us uh, in my office and she has basically offered to have two more collaborations but because we have a department of mass communication which we set up uh, recently and students are quite uh, active there and they are quite active on social media also but we need some kind of entry because it's, it's a, a, a modern university anyway. So they, she has offered to have South Asian Peace Action Network, SAPAN and South Asian Women in Media both will be mentoring our department of, of mass communication. Thank you Ms. Nagar for that and I really like for it. Man, before I go, I would just like to, because I've been uh, as a delegate Jen Chao and uh, uh, Mr. Gokhale was the ambassador there in, in Beijing. Uh, I would just like your opinion about the, the Belt and Road Initiative because that was a big issue when we went there to China and what exactly it means and what we are looking into. Talk about Sri Lanka, I've been examiner to the post Initiative of uh, Medicine for I don't know how many, maybe 15 years uh, for the for the post examinations. Uh, what I've seen transformation in, in 
in Sri Lanka is that you know we are used to go when the terrorism was there. Still, there was some love for the Indians there. But recently, what we see that Chinese are dominated. After Harvard to I identified the Gulf states. It's all dominated by hotels from China, and you find Chinese all over. And you don't find Indians very much there, though they are they are things in it. Because Harvard did the terrorism of Indians. So these two small issues I would like to input for that because we have been to the rest of China and really be as to understand because we were specifically told when we went there that in our uh, whatever the end document was BRI should not be mentioned. <coughs> so we put it down there in Chenchao that we don't want Belt and Road Nation to mention there and we are not so trouble with that. And they didn't treat us very well also by the way it was, it was a very unfortunate kind of uh, interaction with Chinese at the time. And thank you, Miguel, for inviting me and thank you, Ms. Miguel, for being so kind to have you and you in its endeavors. Thank you so much.
That very night, he was deployed with his tanks across the river Tari to fight an advancing Pakistani army. On 5th December, Pillu was killed in a fierce tank battle and lost in the fog of war. On 10th December 1971, my grandfather received this tragic news by a telegram from the army chief. On 15th January 1972, an officer of the regiment brought home his personal belongings and that was to be the only closure that the family ever got. My devastated grandparents built Billu's house in Amritsar on land awarded by the government. They never forgot their brave son who had sacrificed his life for his country. They kept alive his memory, travelling to his regiment year after year, telling and retelling stories about him to me and my sister, their grandchildren. Marja House SF Hill Trust was set up in June 2018 in memory of our dear Binu Thayari. Through Marja House, we hope to keep Binu Thayari's spirit alive and remember the sacrifice made by the brave 22-year-old soldier whose life tragically ended in many ways before it actually began. Thank you all for being here. Good evening. Um, I think, I'm not sure if all of you can see, but it says Avenue Lectures and it says Beyond Borders and it says it's for conversation of, of uh, peace, solidarity and hope. And my grandfather was that, very hopeful. And he didn't leave hope for anybody else, but he did it himself. Um, I think, um, if you look at it, my generation's uh, default position is defeated. My grandfather wasn't ever defeated. And um, at the darkest time, he somehow found hope. And he didn't leave, as I said, he didn't leave it to anybody else, he did it himself. If you could do something for them, for him, that was hope. Um, he did this at a point of time in 2611, when there was a Pakistani delegation of peace activists who came to Delhi. Uh, it was a press club, and nobody wanted to meet them. But my grandfather went, uh, not because he wasn't devastated, or he wasn't angry, or he, wasn't, he didn't feel really strongly about what happened in 2611, but because he could make a distinction between Pakistan and Pakistanis. And he left behind his friends in Siyanpur. Amritsar is a city that looms large in my family's uh, life. It's where my grandfather crossed over. It's where my grandfather became a refugee. It's where my grandfather was homeless. Uh, it's also a place where my grandfather always came every year and ate. So, you know, we, it was always about kulcha and food and things like that. And his dream was that he could eat kulchas in Amritsar and walk across to Lahore and eat Pirni. Uh, well, I'm not sure that dream is going to come true in, um, for a very, very long time. Uh, but for years, we came here to this border to light candles and hope. Um, and, you know, part of the story, um, and you know, we all been headed in the story of partition and are trying to understand uh, very many times what um, and when did that word really come into my life. But as one writer once said to me, she said it was part of furniture. It was something you knew. It was something we experienced. It was something that I don't think I ever enunciated in the world. But it always existed at the heart of my story, of my family's story. Um, but Part of, apart from partition, you know, he talked about walking across Bada. And if you've ever, ever done that, it's sort of a very, uh, it's one of the most powerful things. It was half, you sort of cross over into no man's land and then you're in another country. Um, you know, he, uh, he remembers saying that for that one moment, um, both there, were, there were refugees on this side and there were refugees on that side. And he always said, we stopped for a moment and we looked at each other. And we realized that there were people on this side and people on that side, and we were just the same. Uh, this experience of partition, I think, made, it was something that my grandfather grappled with all his life. It was something he made, tried to make sense of in his journalism. 
Um, but it was also at the heart of who he was. It made him more sensitive. It made him give him gave him empathy. And I think he almost saw that that, that feeling made him sensitive. It made, gave him this idea and so it made him about made talk it sort of was at the heart of his fight for justice in some ways. And I would really like to quote he once wrote this piece and I haven't forgotten that. He wrote about Harsur, which is a small town which got drowned in the Narada when you know with the dams. And he wrote about this in the Indian Express and he said, I waited for 25 years to visit Sialkot, but I couldn't stay there more than 25 minutes. It was a different place. A town is not a roads, houses, or shopping centers. It means neighbors, familiar faces, and those with whom you've grown up. The people of Harsut, wherever they've been resettled, must be thinking of the same place. So many things die within you where the town dies. Such feelings are not tangible, but they remain part of you for the rest of your life. Harsut may be, Harsut's people may be scattered all over the country, but any amount of rubble, a deserted road, a string of song may remind them of the days gone by of a town where they, they and their forefathers had lived. Some wounds never heal. You only begin to live with them. Thank you so much. India Pakistan borders and boundaries Duriya Nazdikya It was August 14 2000 at the Vaga border thousands of people collected to celebrate friendship between India and Pakistan from a platform called Hind Pak Dosti Manch an event which was the effort of common people of Punjab. Kuldeep Nair was at the vanguard of this people-to-people -people movement. Since the last six years, on this very day, he went to the border at the stroke of midnight and lit candles for peace between India and Pakistan, sometimes alone, sometimes with people. Slowly, his caravan grew. First, it was people from Delhi, along with some local groups. Then, people of Amritsar took charge and ownership of the campaign. Kuldeep transformed it into a local initiative, homegrown and homespun, attended by people from many villages around Atari, as well as people from all walks of life in the bustling, burgeoning town of Amritsar. I remember going there with the very first group. At the stroke of midnight, we walked on the strip called No Man's Land with stalwarts like Nikhil Chakravarti, Justice Satchar, Bharti Nayar leading the way. We reached the gate on which was inscribed Islamic Republic of Pakistan. There we stood on tiptoe to see if Pakistan rangers would permit any of our friends to come up to their side of the strip. We learned later that they had not got permission to come to the check post. The respective home ministries of India and Pakistan had denied permission to both sides. Thanks to both governments, when midnight struck, there was no one at either gate.
to light candles of friendship. Regardless, thousands of candles were lit at the stroke of midnight, albeit 800 yards from the border. As light bearers, we epitomize these lines of the poet Majru Sultanpuri. Jala ke mishale ja hum junu sifat chale. Jala ke mishale ja hum junu sifat chale. Jughar ko aag lagaye hamare saath chale. Having lit the taper of life, we mad people set forth. Whoever is ready to torch easy living should come along. From the start to finish, it was a people's show, which accounted for the vibrancy and vitality. Right from the time we Dilli Walas were received at Amritsar Station and taken to the campus of Guru Nanak Dev University, we experienced the warmth and hospitality of Punjab. We reached the border just before the retreat ceremony was to begin. On both sides, were the usual throngs of Indians and Pakistanis, primarily youth, both men and women. It was an exuberant, elated crowd. On the Indian side, a smart military band was playing the popular Dalair Mehndi and Muhammad Rafi songs like Bolo Tara Rara and Ye Desh Haveer Jawano Ka. While the Pakistani side was playing songs of the chart busting group Junoon. Dil hai mera, mulk mera, jaan, jaane jaan. We walked very close to the enclosure where we saw hordes of Pakistani women. They were clapping, waving flags and hands, shouting slogans. On the other end, thousands of young men and boys were dancing, singing, doing Nara Bazi. On our side, the crowd returned song for song and Nara for Nara. Our host from Amritsar told us that this tamasha happens every year. Since August 14th is their celebration, they said, the Pakistanis have come out in much large numbers. At the end of the event, they will become uncontrollable, they said, and the police will have to apply the baton. They told us that in 1993, there was a Punjabi mushaira on the Indian side. On the other side, people had crept as close to the border as they could. So while poems were recited from this side, the wah wah emanated from the other. It was past nine when we reached the pandal erected outside the Vaga check post. On the way, we saw hundreds of people on cycles, on foot, at bullock carts, and some in cars going to the venue of the concert. Hans Raj Hans was going to perform. I had never attended his concert, but knew, knew him as the star whose songs topped the chart on both side, sides, stunning alike for the young and old. At night, that night, he sang and danced in his audience, consisting of people from 20 odd villages around Atari and from Amritsar city, sang and danced with him. Among his audience were 55 girls and boys who had taken the bus from Delhi to show solidarity with the cause. Most of them were students, some artists and others who have taken up the issues of peace and nuclear disarmament as their life's mission. They spent their own money to travel 12 hours on the bus from Delhi to Vaga and had just reached the border when the concert began. When we saw them, they were swaying and dancing with the music, oblivious of the fatigue of the non-stop journey. Hans Raj Hans began with a message from his buddy behen, Abida Parveen. He had spoken to her before coming here. She said, you go and perform and I will sit here in Sindh in the shrines of the Peers and the Fakirs and pray for the India-Pakistan friendship and peace. The man who actually charges a hefty sum for his concert had not only donated his performance but brought along his entire band free of cost. What was immensely important was that throughout the excitement of a rock concert by Punjab's most popular star, the message of peace between Pakistan and India remained central. Hind Park Dosti Manj had arranged a langar for 700 people. The food, the service, the banquet hall, everything had been donated free of cost by common people. 
In the large hall close to the venue, the food was simple, hot, delicious, and plenty. I could not help thinking of the five-star meals in air-conditioned halls where peace conferences are usually held and compare their desolateness with this vibrancy.